Mike Lee, and I'm director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. Really glad you're here this evening to kick off, help us kick off the new academic year's Common Ground Initiative. You know, uh, you notice something different about this Howenstein Center program. It looks a lot different from where we usually are, doesn't it? They're in Lucemore Auditorium. And that's because of John Lokes. John Lokes, of course, is known as uh, Mr. Celebration Cinema, but he also happens to be known as a, an advisor on our, a very distinguished advisor in our advisory cabinet at the Howenstein Center. So my staff and I would very much like to give a shout out to John and his staff for all they did to help make this evening a memorable event. Thank you, John, and staff, good job. Well, tonight we are continuing the Howenstein Center's relentless pursuit of principled pluralism and common ground. We do so by looking at a turning point in American history, a major turning point back in 1968. And within that turning point of 1968, we're looking at a turning point within a turning point. And that's when Gore Vidal and William Buckley, William F. Buckley, duked it out on national television. And when you think about that event, it raises questions, questions I'd like for you to think about. It's whether their combative performance on ABC anticipated really what uh, cable TV would become. For example, cable TV was not really even much on the horizon in those days, but they seemed to anticipate the intellectual style that would mark cable TV. Think about that. Did the, the confrontation of theirs contribute significantly to the growing rift between progressives and conservatives that we see around us today? Did their confrontation focus more on substance or was it more on the camera? Because the camera was able to give us an image of confrontation. It made things louder, more vivid in the confrontation than other means of communication did at that point. And does all of this intellectual sparring that we're about to see, does it amount just to a mere period piece that's interesting historically? Or does it mark a significant transition in American history? Something about what Americans came, would come to expect from the media and from their commentary, how it would be delivered? Are those cameras really so much just focused on Vidal and Buckley, or are they also focused on us as citizens? Focused on us in the sense that we have the awesome responsibility of self-government. And we happen to live in a democracy that is the greatest superpower in the world. All of this adds up to really something quite, quite momentous compared to just something that was on TV for a few hours almost 50 years ago. Now, I had the good fortune in the course of my career to interview both Mr. Vidal and Mr. Buckley, separately, mind you. They were not together during the interviews. I don't know what I would have done, what kind of padding and armor I would have needed to get through that event. But you know what strikes me in retrospect thinking about interviewing both gentlemen is how similar their intellectual styles were. Now, they thought they were marking themselves off from the common run of commentators, but really they were quite similar between them. And I guess I want to just ask and leave you with this question, does it matter? Does it matter to our pursuit of principled pluralism and common ground, what we see tonight? Well, let's roll the reel and find out for ourselves. And afterwards, we will have a panel of experts come forward and give us some very interesting thoughts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to get started soon here with our panel. I'm very pleased to um, present our distinguished panel. Um, in fact, I think I've had all of them in class. So this is very exciting for me. The tables have somewhat turned. Um, so this is great. Um, I will start uh, to my left, your right, Paul Murphy. He's a professor of history at Grand Valley. He specializes in the history of American thought, culture, and politics, and is past president of the Society for U.S. Intellectual History. His 2001 book on the Southern Agrarians and American Conservative Thought won the prestigious Robert Penn Warren Award. Tony Perrine is a professor of film as well as associate director of the School of Communications at Grand Valley. She's a film theorist and historian 
but has produced a number of documentaries as well. Her book, Film and the Nuclear Age, deals with Cold War cinema. Benjamin Lockhart is a professor of English at Grand Valley. He has written extensively on philosophy and religion in British literature. T.S. Eliot has been his focus of late. Professor Lockhart just recently edited the very well-received collection, T.S. Eliot and Christian Tradition, and before that served as president of the T.S. Eliot Society. Uh, so um, I've asked our panelists pr to prepare some uh, general remarks to begin, and I'll put it uh, to Tony first, actually, because many of the reviews that have been released about this film have asked whether it proves its sort of central argument, but not many of them have discussed the form of the film and how the film is constructed, so I'll put it to you, Tony, to begin. Thank you, Joe. I'm really happy to be here, um, and thanks to the Hohenstein Center for um, organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to see this very interesting film. Um, this is the second time I saw it now, and I saw so much more in it this time, actually. Um, so I would just say a couple of things first about the production of the film. The two filmmakers both have a history of making documentaries um, very successfully. Um, Morgan Neville, one of the producer directors, actually won the Academy Award for Best Documentary last year with 20 Feet from Stardom. And um, the other director producer, Robert Gordon, has also made a lot of very successful documentary films. And they've been collaborating since about 1999. Most of their films have been about music, music topics, um, including a film about Muddy Waters. They've done a lot of stuff about music in the South. And um, I thought that was interesting given the important role that music plays in this documentary, although it's not as obvious as the words, it's definitely commenting on the, what we're seeing um, and sometimes very ironic ways and sometimes more subtle ways. So the music was interesting. Um, Robert Gordon is the one who found the footage of the debate and took it to his partner, Morgan Neville, and said this would make a fantastic documentary. Um, how can we pitch it? And I'm going to speculate a little bit here now to say that the way they decided to pitch it, and I think this is true because in a lot of the interviews that um, happened when they premiered the film and after it started to take off and become a critical success, which it has been, it's like got a 94% fresh rating on um, Rotten Tomatoes, but it's really been very well received and um, so they've been talking, been invited to talk a lot about it and including in fora like this where people are just talking about the ideas but also um, with the filmmakers present, of course, talking about the film. And um, they keep saying, and it's kind of their talking point, that people are surprised at how relevant it is. So I can imagine that when they were raising money for the film and it took five years to make, um, and part of that five years would be just uh, um, acquiring rights to the footage, to the music, finding it, but also editing. So this is like a phenomenal editing job. It was. I, I just can't imagine how much um, time they spend in the editing room making the decisions about what to include and of course what to exclude. And if you look, if you think about the documentary is sort of structured around the 10 debates as a boxing match, so it's got 10 rounds and it's even got the bell to start each round. Um, not all of the debates are equally represented, but certainly the ones that have the most personal invective are the ones that are selected. Um, and I think that that's, again, part of the way they decided to present uh, the, I think there are kind of two interrelated theses, but the main one is that this moment changed politics in the way that it's covered in the media forever. That's the, I think, the, the part of it that they don't totally successfully provide evidence for, but I think that they present it in such a compelling way that it's pretty persuasive anyway. Um, which tells you something about the power of the medium, I think. And I, I do think it's funny, I'll just take a moment here to talk about the meta <laughs> discourse that we have going on right here. So part of what the film is about is image, camera, theater, um, all of this kind of thing. And I bet a lot of you are looking at that instead of us because that's the way it works, like that's the power. <laughs> and, um, and that's the way that the documentary is constructed too, like so much of it is foregrounding the construction of the news and the way that the 
debates are presented so you see a lot of the mechanics of making the news or constructing the news. You see the sets, you see the technicians, you see the control room. So this kind of whole editorial process of how to present um, and mediate for the audience really uh, the, the main ideas that are, are um, well, in this case, in the debates are, are being expressed. And it is a compilation documentary, so that means, of course, that there's a lot of archival footage and that's a lot of work to find it all and to decide how to order it. Um, and then the document, or the, excuse me, the interviews are the other important aspect in terms of um, the, I guess you could call it the primary um, material. And that, again, is a process of selection and ordering, so you've got a lot of interviews with a lot of different people that have like cr authority, credibility, insight, objectivity perhaps, and that's part of it is like, well, we have people who are, you know, kind of Vidal supporters and people who are kind of Buckley supporters and then people who are kind of objective or, or perhaps that way. And then, and uh, so you get a sense of objectivity, I think, from the way that it's structured. And I think I probably already passed my five minutes right now, so I'm going to leave it at that. But um, there's so much more to say about um, this very interesting documentary, so, but I'll, I'll pass it on. Well, then I'll, I'll put it to you, Paul. So could you talk a bit about the sort of intellectual context of this film? And also, one question it raises, I think implicitly, is whether or not, c certainly in this case, Vidal and Buckley could be considered public intellectuals, but the film raises the question, I think at the end, whether public intellectuals exist today at all and in what form. So I'll put it to you then. Uh, thanks, Joe, and, and thanks, thanks again for the invitation to you and Gleaves in the center. Um, I think that's a great question. I think in many ways that's what the, the movie is about. It's about the question of can you communicate ideas through our modern media and also what happened to public intellectualism, right? And uh, is there some sort of connection between the two? Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the movie as coming at a problem that we perceive as existing in our society. And uh, it's the problem of, uh, not to coin a phrase, but common ground, right? Or, um, or some sort of deterioration of our, of our ability to speak to each other about politics or communicate clearly about politics, right? And, and I think there's two arguments uh, that can be made um, coming out of a discussion of the movie. And, and one is there's something wrong with our media. And the other is there's something wrong with our discourse. And, and I think the idea that comes through strongly at the end of the movie is that something is wrong with the media through which we communicate, which here is television and radio, um, perhaps Twitter or something like that can be thrown in, um, that it doesn't allow for reasoned debate. And that, um, as Vidal says at some point, he talks about the image, and that's uh, something that comes up in his play, right? That this is politics is about image anymore. And he says something like, well, this is the medium in which we're working or something. This is, these are the, the terms of the realm or something like that. And, and, uh, and this is a, sort of the old you know, Postman argument that television isn't about reason discourse, it's about entertainment. And insofar as you move towards a society in which people communicate and get their information through television, you can no longer have a rational society, right? The other thing, though, that strikes me uh, is uh, at the end you hear someone saying something like they're speaking different languages, uh, right towards the end. And I, and I think when I initially s saw it, it uh, made me think of a quotation from the historian, the liberal historian R Richard Hofstadter in the 1960s. Uh, and he hated, uh, he, he hated the right, and he spent a lot of his time diagnosing the right as neurotic, irrational, and anti-intellectual, <laughs> right? So let me read you something he said about Barry. Uh, he wrote about the Goldwater campaign in, in 64. Uh, and uh, he said, in a couple different places, and I'll read you just a couple snippets, probably everyone in public life deserves a sympathetic exposition of his ideas. But I find myself unable to enter in his mental world, which seems to be that of another century and a wholly different style of thought. Uh, and, he, and he talks about how these, these paranoid sp uh, spokesmen, because he'd like to talk about the right as paranoid, right, neurotic. He says, they love empirical data and facts, um, uh, but ama amassing evidence becomes for this person, quote, a defensive act which shuts off his receptive apparatus and protects him from having to attend to disturbing considerations that do not fortify his ideas. He calls these kinds of thinkers, uh, this kind of thinker, he says, quote, has all the evidence he needs. He is not a receiver, he is a transmitter. And, and, I, and I used to like that quotation because I thought, well, 
maybe there's something to this, that this ideological, there is a problem with our discourses and we live in these, these, these different ideological wor worlds. But I'm skeptical actually now of both of those arguments, <laughs> um, that, that our problem is our media or our, or our problem is our discourse. And that, for example, if we had a different medium and we could talk rationally, uh, we, would, we would understand each other and everything would be okay, which implies if, if, if the other side would just be reasonable, <laughs> wouldn't everything work out, right? Which I think we do understand each other and we just have very deep divisions on lots of issues. And, and I also think that that's lurking a little behind Hofstadter, and you see it in the movie, where despite the deep and profound uh, political, social, cultural conflicts of the 60s, which are built on deep and profound political divisions that, that, that create a politics of sort of absolute, authentic, in the street divisions, which is reflected in the 68 convention, there is this idea um, that um, the other side is extremist, and if they would just go away, or they'd be less paranoid and neurotic, everybody would agree with me. Right, mm -hmm. and even from the other side, it's it's the silent majority really supports my position, right? Mm -hmm. And and I, I think once again that's untrue. That it's it's not just a discursive problem. That there are in fact real political social phenomenon which evoke deeply felt differences of opinion, which is the reality of the society in which we live. <laughs> uh, um, the media or the sort of ideological languages we use, uh, uh, regardless. So maybe that's enough for me. I think that leads into Dr. Locker's points. Is that Thank you. Yeah. Well, they've placed me on the left and <laughs> given me a mic that doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, I, I came away from seeing the documentary with two observations. First, uh, and this is obvious, uh, Buckley and Vidal did very little debating of the issues. Uh, their deep distrust of each other's fundamental motives prevented it. Uh, we should be able to do better than that. Second, the major issues have not changed very much. This was also striking to me in half a century. We are still dealing with questions of poverty, race, military activity, action, capitalism, income disparity, sexuality, and so on. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the failure of, uh, to debate the issues. That seems to be the main point of the documentary, and as Tony pointed out, the di directors have emphasized that in their choice of footage. So maybe the documentary makes it out to be worse than it really was. And I haven't seen the whole uh, debate sequence, but I would hope that they sometime or other debated issues. They did. They did? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, this, I think, skews it, the documentary skews it a little bit. Uh, but, and even, but even in what we have in the documentary, I think that while attacking each other personally, the two do clarify some issues along the way. Still, this documentary makes me wish for political debates with more content and more careful thought. It would help immensely if the conservatives and liberals debating did not assume that the other side was acting in bad faith. It isn't good for conservatives to assume that liberals want to destroy Western civilization, or for liberals to assume that conservatives just want to oppress the poor and hang on to their wealth. A constructive debate would begin with the assumption that both sides desired less poverty, less violence, better health, more liberty, and at the same time more order, national security, less racial tension, a thriving economy. In short, the assumption that both sides sought the common good for our nation and for the world. Then they could get down to arguing forcefully about their differing views as to how to achieve that. There are debaters who have set a high standard in this regard, and I think an excellent example was the uh, presented by the Hounstein Center in the spring when the center brought Robert George and Cornell West here to debate. I was teaching that night and didn't see it, but did it? Uh, I assume it turned out well. That is that they debated seriously, but in a friendly manner. And uh, these two Princeton professors have been debating each other for years. And they've become friends, apparently, even though their views have not changed very much. They're at least trying to find some common ground. That, that I think, uh, sets a good model. 
Here's another example in this, uh, from the same generation as Buckley and Vidal. In the 70s, Russell Kirk uh, debated many different liberals. I haven't seen films of any of those debates, but I'm told that Kirk developed a friendly antagonism with Dick Gregory, uh, the comedian turned political commentator. And it must have looked funny to see them on stage together, Gregory, this very tall black man, and Kirk, this uh, not so tall uh, white fellow. And um, I imagine that those debates were far more substantive than the ones we've witnessed this evening. Uh, Kirk was always somewhat open to liberal ideas because he repeatedly emphasized that, um, and Kirk's a mentor, was a mentor of mine, but, and still is, but he repeatedly emphasized that a wise conservative has to realize that some things have to change, and a wise liberal has to realize that uh, some things have to stay the same, that there are things worth preserving. And I think that's a good starting point as well. Now, with my colleague Paul Murphy, it's easy to assume that his intentions are good because he's just such a nice fellow. Uh, we've disagreed quite a few times without endangering our friendship, and I think we could explore our disagreements even more intensely without calling each other names. Uh, one starting point for serious debates would be to cross over into that other world because I think we, we I, I see your point, Paul, but I think that we, uh, it's clear that we do inhabit different realms intellectually, mentally today in the political arena and all we try to immerse ourselves mostly in things that support what we already think. Uh, I could read editorials from the New York Times and Paul could read some from the Wall Street Journal. But we could do better than that. We could read serious books on political philosophy. Paul could read books by Edmund Burke, by Russell Kirk, Roger Scruton, Richard Weaver, T.S. Eliot, and other serious conservative thinkers, and I could read whatever he recommended. There must be some serious books by liberals. <laughs> Somewhere. Uh, a starting point for a well-intentioned discussion uh, might, uh, well, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's enough. Uh, let me give you this quotation from T.S. Eliot. Uh, my man Elliot, he's a, he was a conservative down to the core, but he said this, Con, uh, conservatism is too often conservation of the wrong things. Liberalism, a relaxation of discipline. Revolution, a denial of the permanent things. I think if a conservative admitted that some things should not be conserved, Perhaps a liberal could admit that discipline is needed and that there are, in fact, some permanent things that should be preserved. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lackard. Um, I'll put a, a number of questions to Tony and Paul. The first one could be, um, have liberals written any good books? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, of course. <laughs> um, my, my deeper question is, um, uh, the. Uh, I think both the film raises this question, and we've also raised this, raised this question. Can the left and the right speak to each other constructively? Can they speak the same language? Um, what has gone wrong in the discourse? If it's on television, um, is it the, uh, the acrimonious debate that we've seen in the film, but also today? Um, or is it something sort of more implicit in the way we talk to each other or in the fact that we may not be debating about the same issues at all? This? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that I agree with what Paul said in terms of it's not so much television. And actually, there's a nostalgia in the film for this magical era of television unifying the nation that never really existed, I don't think. And if you think about even the history of television, most households didn't have. TV until 1958, and this is only 10 years after that. Um, and to sort of make these large claims for how TV, I mean, lots of people did watch TV, 80% of the country did watch the um, 
the conventions, et cetera. But it, it was such a short period of time in the history of the United States that I don't think you could make the claim that you know there was this you know period of time when television had this function and then it was gone after 1968 when Buckley tried you know swore at Vidal, um, and I think that that's part of the problem with the, the documentaries. It kind of makes a larger claim than that it can actually support. Definitely television changed politics and it changed political discourse. I mean, there's no denying that. I think it was more the advent of cable television and they do allude to that in the documentary that it was the advent of the um, cable news networks of which, by the way, CNN was the first. And, and by the way, more people still watch CBS news than watch Fox news. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's suggesting, and again, compelling ways, but not ne necessarily ones that are supported in the documentary that this kind of division of what was once unity occurred with television. Well, I agree completely about the idea of uh, an imagined golden age being a recurring need that we have each other, we have as a society, or some of us have anyways, that if, if we could be as unified as we were uh, uh, in Pearl Harbor and that greatest generation, and maybe we had it for a moment, or uh, if uh, uh, the consensus uh, historians of the 50s used to say, uh, you know, it, it, everybody used to agree, and there is this bedrock common set of values we have, and something's wrong now because what's happened, right? And I think it's often illusory, and I, and I think the question is, is, is what is the problem, right? I mean, what is, what is the difficulty? I mean, I think Ben and I uh, understand each other. Ben knows where to find good, sensible, useful information, the New York Times, and <laughs> I know where to find the uh, paranoid intellectual rantings. <laughs> but no, I mean, I think, uh, I think we've probably read each other's books to some extent, uh, right? Um, and there's interesting moments in the documentary which, which you see that, for example, you have Reed Buckley, uh, who has a sort of, um, uh, what, a bit of his brother in him, right? It must have been a, ba a Buckley family trait of a twinkle in his eye. But he says at one point how terrible Vidal was, but um, that he hated the country and he talked about us of an empire. And he said, well, then that, in that he was absolutely right, right? And, and, there, and there you have a way in which there are often moments in our current politics today where the, the right and the left supposedly actually converge. And they converge some, sometimes on this question of foreign policy and American might, right? Where you could have someone like Buckley agreeing about the uh, sort of overextension of the nation and worries about the, the American imperial state. The other thing that is, seems to me important to note is the nice job the documentary filmmakers do of evoking the moment in 68 of these, uh, this, this police riot, this dire state, and you see a very sober Vidal saying something very serious about the country at that point. And you have Buckley very clearly making his point, which is that uh, this is a matter of law and order. Um, earlier, Vidal had said, revolution requires blood. Jefferson endorsed this. Sometimes you have to have revolution. And you have Buckley saying, this is a time when I want order. And these people in the streets have to be put in their place, right? Uh, and, and what's not communicated there? What is not understood? <laughs> you know, and you have that as a moment in which I think uh, the nation is confronting a very profound question. And, uh, and people are communicating very clearly about what they think needs to be done. So then I'll ask, I'll ask you, Paul, but also the panel. Uh, another question um, that the film seems to raise is, so of course there was acrimony in the, the debate, um, but at the same time, uh, there's something obviously very educated about both Vidal and Buckley, and the film seems to imply that what's missing in today's debate is that our debaters on the left and the right both aren't educated to the degree that uh, both of these uh, public intellectuals were, um, so I'd ask, what do you make of the sort of apparent claim that public intellectual, intellectualism in our country has sort of uh, gone sour, sort of has gone away? Yeah, this, this I think is a very live question, at least amongst um, the historians that I sort of follow. This, the, there was a book that appeared almost 30 years ago by Russell Jacoby called The Last Intellectuals, and it was a it was a complaint and a lament about the decline of the public intellectual 
Now, what he meant was a generation of sort of New York-based intellectuals who were sort of literary critics, cultural critics, people like Lionel Trilling, and they published in small circulation magazines, but they could speak broadly across the spectrum of American interests, and they had the ear of, of sort of elite, uh, and they were very urbane, and they were very um, oftentimes brilliant, right? And many of them ended up gravitating to the right, you know, by the 60s and 70s. Uh, and he said the problem was academia, right? I mean, uh, the pro the, the, they used to have this sort of scrambling life that intellectuals would have to make their, their way by surviving in a marketplace where they had to learn to write well, and then they had to publish, right, in magazines where people would pay them to publish in. And but that, once you get to be academic, you become abstruse and theoretical and irrelevant, right? Um, and uh, and I, so, so, of course, academic uh, people fret about this all the time. We don't have this hold, right? I mean, why aren't people listening to us? And, and the serious question is, 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 can you bring ideas, sophisticated ideas, uh, based on sort of certain uh, norms of objective research and, and all the rest, can they be brought to bear in our public debates? And, and, it was, and, and presuming there was a time that they were, what has happened? Where have those intellectuals gone? Uh, and then uh, people often say, oh, well, there's plenty of them, right? Look at George Will, look at um, the science guy who's talking about all this stuff. Um, but I, but I, I think there's something to that complaint and, and I'm not ready to dismiss <laughs> the argument made by this film, uh, which is that uh, the, the, the allure of TV, uh, TV becomes, or speaking in snippets on Twitter, becomes the way you communicate to the masses. And, and these intellectuals know it's about performance, celebrity, and image, and they succumb. And, and, and that does ultimately um, squeeze out or um, um, push out of the public square that space that might have been there before for more sort of... Now, on the other hand, you had Buckley and Fireline. So, I mean, evidently it was a show that you could have quite thoughtful conversations on, right? So, contradictions. Yeah, I'm just worrying about how I look on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take, maybe this is the appropriate moment to say how the film emphasizes the similarities between the two antagonists. Um, they were actually born the same year. Of course, we saw how they had a similar kind of upbringing. Um, they were both pretty iconoclastic. And there are a number of moments when various commentators talk about, well, what is the real source of this antagonism and what the film suggest is that it's, you know, Buckley's kind of latent or repressed homosexuality. And that's also, that's another claim that it doesn't really support, but is quite provocative, I think, and it is the kind of thing that Buckley himself um, would be, you know, likely to sock someone in the mouth over. But I, I think it's, um, you know, this commonality that they have the interesting question to me is like, what is the source of the difference? Like if they were raised in such similar ways and they were both kind of um, expatriates in a way because Buckley, his early childhood was spent in Mexico and you know, the, he, Spanish was his first language and, and such like that. So they had like an outsider's perspective for sure. And it's just interesting that they, you know, saw the world so differently given that similarity. I don't know how to explain it myself. Well, uh, I'd like to take a crack at that because I think it, the documentary doesn't really bring this out very well, but the, the big difference probably between the two of them is a philosophical difference. I think uh, conservatives are philosophical realists on the whole. They think, or we think, that there's a reality in the nature of things that exists whether I believe in it or not. And uh, liberalism tends to be relativistic. I know I'm uh, painting with a broad brush here, but uh, tends to say, and certainly Gore Vidal is a relativist, a philosophical relativist, that, uh, that, we, uh, that, that reality is an idea that is made by an individual's existential choices or by a society's cultural conditioning. 
So I, I think that that's probably where the two of them uh, why? part ways. Why? Why? <laughs> why? Well, no, I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there are these different views of, of reality. They've, they've been there since the ancient Greeks and, uh, and people part ways on this. And, uh, you know, just to keep it from being too nice, uh, uh, liberalism, <laughs> liberalism uh, the more it uh, separates itself from reality, uh, gets closer and closer to uh, destroying itself as well as other things. Well, we, you could you could you could field that, or if you'd like to chew on it, we can also uh, take some questions oh, from the. Questions. Yeah, sure, please. I'd like to push a little farther on what uh, Tony and the gentleman at the. You know, I would say a quick thing, uh, that I absolutely believe that amongst uh, these folks there's deep and profound philosophical differences. For example, um, I mean, I believe that what, uh, this is an excellent explanation of Russell Kirk's point of view, and he was a sort of philosophically uh, informed, theoretically informed historian of America. But when Buckley ran for mayor of New York, right, I mean, he was getting these working class, lower middle class ethnics, and I don't think he was appealing to them on philosophical points. He might have said that, right? But the, uh, the grievances had to do with issues about uh, the welfare state, crime, race, um, attitudes about patriotic reactions to the war. And, uh, and so while there are philosophically opposed liberals and conservatives, and we do have this way we want to try and figure out why does one go one way, why does one go the other, right? We have these psychological explanations. Uh, but. Uh, but I mean, it's a somewhat baffling question because I think there's a lot of people who, who need not be explained their political beliefs by their psychology, but also it's not necessarily a deep philosophical concern either. I think those labels vary, right? I mean, the, um, they're epithets. I mean, one thing that strikes me is um, in, the, in the 60s, um, what Buckley did was he was not a great thinker, I don't think. He never wrote his great philosophical book. He was an organizer, and he put the conservative label uh, into politics. He l helped form a movement which took over the Republican Party. They moved away from labels like the extremist right, um, and, uh, and a lot of that is, is word pay, play in language. Uh, and he was a great tactician and a brilliant political operative and also a smart guy, right? I mean, he wrote in a scintillating way. But, um, but those labels, right and left, I think, you, you, could, you could go through and say, oh, they suggest certain things coming out of the French Revolution, right, where, where, the, where, the, where the revolutionary sat in the, in the assembly. And, and what distinguishes a sort of a Marxist frame of mind from a conservative one. But I think, I, I think what you're getting at is the way in which those labels are not particularly helpful, right? Because they become sort of epithets, and the coin of our political debate has become less of a party for all the focus on conventions is striking how unimportant political parties become, relatively speaking, when you, for example, you can see someone like Trump who isn't really um, sort of fit in with the Republican Party, but he might well win, win their nomination. And more of these labels, conservative and liberal, right, left, labels which a lot of people have a hard time uh, figuring out exactly what they mean in a consistent way, right? Because most people aren't political philosophers. Yeah. Um, That's why they put me in the middle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree with Paul. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but I just wanted to add that, um, and I think you said this, that the, 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 le the left and the right tend to break apart into different groups, and those groups tend to shift. and. So uh, Russell Kirk, for example, is kind of called a traditionalist conservative, but then you've got the neoconservatives who were very prominent in the 80s, 90s, and into the Bush administration, who are uh, concerned with uh, spreading democracy through the world by military might. Kirk hated that, and he, he hated, um, he, he came to hate Bush number one, uh, for his invasion of, uh, of Iraq, the first Iraq war, and, in my, and the second Iraq war, he would have just 
uh, hated completely. So uh, there are those branches. Then you get the libertarians, and that's another, uh, I think Kirk, Kirk spoke against the libertarians and argued with them. He was in a uh, television debate with uh, Ayn Rand at one point, and she held up a dollar bill and said, this should be your god. So, no, the typical, no, the typical voter, I, I don't think, does understand. And the labels aren't very useful because there are these different branches within them. I just want to say one more thing about uh, uh, the climactic event in the film, which is in the ninth debate, um, when Buckley calls Vidal a crypto-Nazi. And that seems to be like the source of the personal animus, just in terms of uh, Buckley's role in um, changing what conservative, conservatism meant, which was you know, largely understood to be code for anti-Semitic and kind of ultra right wing. And that, that's what Buckley really got upset about was to be like, uh, have that, uh, all that work that he did to remove that relationship or that connection kind of thrown in his face. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. That's right. Please give our panel a hand.